Hello, Tennessee media students and advisors. My name is Michael Elson, and I am the Director of Digital Media and Broadcasting at Christ Presbyterian Academy right here in Nashville, Tennessee. This is my 10th year leading our media program at CPA, and I am more excited than ever before because this year CPA is launching our Institute for Cultural Engagement, which houses five centers of study. There's inquiry and design, media and publication, business, arts and entertainment, and mercy and justice. Specifically, my friend and colleague Heather Nagel and I lead the Center for Media and Publication. If you don't know journalism and yearbook legend Heather Nagel, then look her up and go watch the video she presented earlier to today's workshop because she's a great resource involving anything and everything in the print media world. Now, media plays a huge role in our center's programming at CPA. My number one asked question is what all does media encompass at CPA? So today, I'm gonna to give you guys a quick overview of the five courses I teach in the digital media side of the Media and Publication Center. Then, you're gonna hear from four of our student leaders who will be presenting lessons of their own. The first class I teach is called Media Foundations, and in that class, students get a taste of the four main genres of digital media. In that class, I teach the basics and the foundation of news and sports broadcasting, digital media publishing, which is commercial marketing and advertising, television and cinema, and documentary storytelling, which is a class I'm really excited about because it's going to allow our students to travel and go on location to cover stories all around the world, from the beaches of Hawaii, to the film studios in Los Angeles, the glaciers of Alaska, and even the lighthouses of Maine. But why choose media? Why does CPA prioritize media? Well, there are really three reasons I believe that at some point every student, whether they're in the center or not, should take a media class. The first reason is our head of school, Nate Morrow, always promotes the strength of learning communication and collaboration through publication. We partner with nonprofit and for-profit organizations to provide internships and opportunities for our students to report on real-world issues. Providing students with the opportunity to have real-world experience and make connections with industry professionals is something I'm passionate about, and we believe this will benefit and better prepare our students for their futures. The second reason for why media is because media really encompasses every topic imaginable. Students are consistently absorbing media on a daily and sometimes minute-by-minute -minute basis, so we want to teach students not only how to interpret the media that society is presenting to them, but also how to translate those messages and one day be able to create messages of their own so that they can effectively communicate and publish their work to influence the world. Equipping our students to be productive citizens and positive culture shapers is our ultimate goal. And finally, the third reason for why media is just because it's enjoyable. We are not a traditional classroom. Students are up and moving around almost every day using production equipment to produce news and sports broadcasts, short films, commercials, music videos, documentaries, and even blooper reels. Yes, we learn how to utilize technology and students learn how to use various applications within the Adobe Creative Suite like Premiere, After Effects, Photoshop, and InDesign and we strive to produce quality work. But man, do we have a lot of laughs throughout the process. Now don't take my word for it. To see some of the good times we've had in the media studio over the past decade, please visit our at CPA Media Studio YouTube channel or Instagram account. Now without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to four of our media student leaders who each have an important lesson to share with you today. I hope you enjoy watching. Take it away, guys. Hi, my name is Luke and I'm the Master Editor for the Digital Media Program at Christ Presbyterian Academy. In our program, we use several applications within Adobe Creative Suite. Today, I'm going to explain how to create a 3D text graphic in Adobe After Effects. When learning After Effects, for the first time, it's almost like learning a new language. But what I've experienced is once you practice and you understand the basic workflow of the software, it's fairly simple to create special effects to enhance your digital stories. Now, the first step when creating a 3D graphic is to go up to the toolbar and click Composition, New Composition. You want to make sure that your composition is at least 30 seconds long. Once your composition has been created, click the text tool at the top of the, your window. Then add your text by clicking in the middle of your canvas window, which is this big black box. You can type any words you like, but for now, I'm just going to type my name. This is the stage where you should highlight your text to change the size and font. You can do that all over here. Next, click on the text layer in your sequence, then select Layer, Auto Trace, and OK. 
At this point, go back to the toolbar and hit Layer, New, and Solid. This screen will turn a color, like mine is red, and don't worry, it's supposed to happen. It's important to remember that in Adobe After Effects, whatever layer is on top means in front of. Is If you move your solid layer under your original text layer, then your words will appear again. Now click on your solid layer, and then select Effect Video Copilot Element in your toolbar. Now this element effect is a plugin that my school has purchased for us to use with Adobe After Effects. You can purchase this plugin from Video Copilot. Now go to Custom Layers, Custom Text and Masks, Path Layer 1, and then select your Auto Trace Layer. Then hit Scene Setup and Extrude to make your Auto Trace text look 3D. It'll now appear to be 3D, but we're not done yet. Next, go to Presets to choose your specific elements such as gold, glass, or chrome. Then select your bevel, or your thickness, of your text and hit OK in the top right corner. Next, go back down to your sequence and hide your text layer by Auto Trace Layer and by clicking the eye next to each layer. Finally, it's time to actually make the project three-dimensional. Now go back to your toolbar and hit Layer, New, Camera. Then, to re record your digital camera movements, go to the Camera tool and hit Transform. Then click on the clock icon next to Position to turn on keyframing. Once you enable keyframing, your first keyframe, or diamond, will appear in your sequence. From here, you can drag your cursor anywhere to the right in your sequence and use the camera tool to move your camera. Every time you move your camera, a digital keyframe will appear. Once you feel happy with what you've created, go back to your toolbar and click Composition, Add to Render Queue. Click on the blue text next to where it says Output To and your name and save your project. Finally, hit Render and sit back and listen to the satisfying noise that lets you know your project is complete. Once you hear that sound effect, you're all done. That's all I have for you today, and I hope you learned something very valuable in this video, and I can't wait to see the work you all create at your school. Hello, I'm Madison, and I'm a senior at Christ Presbyterian Academy. This is my third year as the head writer for the fiction division of our CPA Digital Media Program. Today, I'm excited to share our writing process with you, including crafting a log line, deciding on a genre, developing a well-rounded character, and maintaining an engaging story structure. While my first project, a short film called Family Feud, was a success, the writing team decided more time was needed to cultivate our creativity. Also, I quickly realized that several drafts are required, so you need to allow yourself time to revise each script. In the screenwriting book called Save the Cat, one of their suggestions is to plot out each scene on color-coded sticky notes. On each sticky note, you include the scene location, conflict, and change that scene introduces in the story. However, because this is my third year leading the writing team, I have been able to modify this lesson to make the writing process more fun and productive for all involved. Last year, my team produced a mini-series called Neighborhood Watch. What many people don't re realize is that my team and I started brainstorming in May for the following school year. We wrote and threw out about 300 pages of different drafts of our scripts over a dozen or so meetings throughout the summer. We refined each draft, focusing on the three most important components of the script. Genre, which includes pacing and tone, character, which includes dialogue, and story structure, which includes choosing interesting and realistic filming locations. The first step in crafting a story is to develop the logline. The logline is a brief synopsis of the story. For example, the logline for Neighborhood Watch was, with crime on the rise in the neighborhood of hometown, a group of high school students reconnect to solve mysteries and discover what it truly means to be a good neighbor. Loglines have three parts. First, define the hero. So the Neighborhood Watch was an ensemble cast, the ensemble was our hero. Then, establish the conflict. Our conflict was crime in the neighborhood of hometown that needed to be solved. Lastly, the logline establishes the tone and even hints at the theme of your story which for Neighborhood Watch was community and unity. Again, in the book Save the Cat by Blake Snyder, he outlines 10 movie genres, but I'm going to briefly cover five of the most universal. The first is Monster in the House, where there is a confined universe and a threat within that world that the characters must confront. The second genre is called The Golden Police, where a hero is after a specific item but is transformed mentally and emotionally along the way. The Hobbit is a perfect example of this. The third and best title genre is Dude with a Problem. 
It's the chronicle of any ordinary guy put in extraordinary circumstances. A similarly large genre is buddy love, which is any type of dynamic duo story, including both friendship and romance. The fifth and most universal genre is superhero, which is the antithesis of Dude with the Problem. Superhero isn't exclusive to Superman or Captain America, though. It's a story about any extraordinary hero in an ordinary world. Character is the least formulaic aspect of storytelling. The essence of the story is conflict, and once you know the hero's quest, you must establish the conflict, or the obstacle you must overcome. Then you create a real person to undergo the trials of the quest. In Neighborhood Watch, one of the stories that resonated most with me was Arthur Robinson. He is a fairly abnormal character, based on Sherlock Holmes, but his story arc is about accepting change in friendships and taking a leap into the unknown. In Family Feud, our character Rachel Prince was an, as aggressive as imaginable, but underneath her tough facade, she just wanted to be accepted for who she was. Every character should resonate with someone, even if they aren't the funniest or the most charming character. The characters really help to set the tone of the story. And finally, once you know the story you want to tell, you have to determine how best to tell it in a clear and engaging way, which leads to story structure. When I talk about linear stories, I'm saying that the story goes from point A to point B with no interruptions to that timeline. Star Wars is an example of a linear narrative. Any narrative with a discontinuous timeline is fragmented in some way. Examples of a nonlinear structure is a framework narrative, like The Great Gatsby, the Bourne movies, and 2019's Little Women, which intersperses the past with the present to show the characters as adults before del delving into their childhoods. Story structure is just one of the tools a writer can use to communicate themes, manipulate suspense, and alter the audience's perception of a person or event. While writing may not be the most active phase of digital storytelling, I can tell you from personal experience that spending time creating a well-structured story with clear theme makes the production and post-production phases even more enjoyable. I hope this has been helpful, and happy writing. Hey there, I'm Logan and I serve as the audio engineer for the digital media program at CPA. As you probably know, sound is a very important aspect of broadcast media and filmmaking, and today I'll be going through some tips to help you achieve high quality sound recordings. First, I want to touch on the physics of sound. Every sound is caused by vibration. Think about what happens when you throw a pebble into a lake. There are ripples that travel on the surface of the water. Sound is just like that, except it travels in a sphere, traveling equally in all directions. Now, the distance between each wave is called frequency, which affects the pitch of the sound. A bird chirping, for example, would have a higher frequency than a cow mooing. Frequency is measured in hertz, and the average person can hear between 16 and 16,000 hertz, although that range shrinks as we age. The size of sound waves is called amplitude, which affects the volume. Amplitude is measured in decibels, and the larger the wave, the higher the decibel. Finally, when sound waves reach us, our eardrum vibrates in response to the sound waves. Every microphone has its own eardrum, if you will, called the diaphragm. Now, I'm going to be reviewing the four main types of microphones and their pickup patterns we commonly use in digital media. Lavalier, shotgun, condenser, and dynamic microphones. I'll start off with lavaliers, or lavs, because they require the most setup. Lav mics are best used as a backup set of microphones for interviews in case there is an extra crew member to hold a boom pole or an on-camera interviewer holding a mic. They have an omnidirectional pickup pattern, which means they capture sound from all sides equally, so keep that in mind while you're filming. To set up most sets of lav mics, you will need to mount the transmitter to the camera or mini recorder and turn it on. Then, ensure that the mic is plugged into the receiver and turn the receiver on. After checking to make sure both the transmitter and receiver are on the same channel, attach the mics to the subject and you're good to go. It's always smart to check your audio before you film your actual interview. Next up we have shotgun mics, which are used on boom poles and positioned close to the subject. They are the highest quality option for most shooting situations. They have a directional pickup pattern so the mic will only pick up sound that is a short distance in front of it, so make sure you hold them relatively close to the subject. This is helpful when you are filming interviews on location when there is a lot of background noise. This tutorial video, for example, is being recorded with a shotgun microphone. Condenser mics are high sensitivity, high quality microphones, best suited for instruments, vocal recordings, narrations, or voiceovers, and also podcast applications. Condenser mics usually require mic stands or shock mounts due to their sensitivity. They have a cardioid pickup pattern, which is semi-directional. Another note on these mics is that they require 48 volt phantom power to run properly, so make sure that whatever device you're recording on has that setting enabled, like the Zoom Mini Recorder. Finally, dynamic microphones are a great solution for live presentations and on-location interviews. They are omnidirectional, require no phantom power, and they're designed to be handheld. 
and they require almost zero setup besides the on-off switch. No matter which microphone you use to record your sound, always make sure the decibel levels are between negative five and zero, as zero is set to be scientifically consistent on all recording devices, soundboards, and video players. If you get into a jam and accidentally record some background sound like an air conditioner or some static, you can try to put a high pass or low pass filter in your audio files in Adobe Premiere and reduce the sound of those frequencies. I hope this presentation has given you some insight into the world of sound, and I hope you have a better understanding of each type of microphone and their application with your projects. Hi, my name is Logan and I'm the Director of Photography for the Digital Media Program at Christ Presbyterian Academy. I'm here in our studio where you can find many of our cinematography tools we use to enhance our digital storytelling. Today, I'm going to present one of our more advanced pieces of equipment, the Mavic Drone. So you can use some of these techniques for your projects. Keep in mind, even when using the drone, remember that basic cinematography rules still apply, such as the rule of thirds, 180 degree rule, and Hitchcock's rule. Now, for several of my projects, I used the drone to capture establishing shots to orient the audience. For example, last year I purchased my first personal drone and earned my official drone license so I could capture shots all around Nashville and for our miniseries Neighborhood Watch. I filmed everywhere from downtown Nashville to my own backyard with the goal of adding professional quality to our productions. The first step when operating the drone is to place your smartphone in the drone controller, if required. Open the drone's app on your phone. For most DJI drones, the app is called DJI Go 4. To power on the controller, click the power button once, then again, and hold it until it beeps. Do the same process to turn on the drone itself. Most drones have an automatic takeoff option, but you can also take off by bringing the two main sticks on the controller down and towards the middle, or down and away from each other, to start the drone's motors. Once the motors have started, push the left stick up to gain altitude. Pushing the left stick to the left or right controls the pan movement of the drone. The right stick controls the direction in which the drone physically moves. Pushing the right stick forward will make the drone move forward, while pulling the right stick back will make it the drone move backwards. On DJI drones, the speed at which the drone travels is dependent upon which mode you choose to fly in. Sample modes include tripod mode, GPS, and sport mode, which is the fastest. To switch between modes, use the switch on the front of the controller. To pitch or tilt the drone's camera up and down, use the dial on the top left of the controller. Turning the dial towards the right will pitch the camera up, while turning it to the left will pitch the camera down. Incorporating these drone shots really helps put things into perspective and allows the audience to take a step or flight back and look at the big picture. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for joining us in the CPA Media Studio today. Please feel free to email me with any questions at michael.elson at cpalions.org. Until next time, this is Michael Elson, signing off.